Well, good evening and welcome. And Bob, reunited. It feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> and how about that? Tom, thank you very much for those wonderful introductions. And how about the big news today that Bob is coming back to CBS News to provide commentary? Yep. Cheers went up in the newsrooms at CBS today. So tell us what it will mean. Well, I've, I'm still retired. Uh, <laughs> But uh, David Rhodes came to me and said, uh, would you like to, uh, said, we need somebody to kind of add historical context. And I said, well, I'm the oldest guy out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, you know, Nora, I've been covering politics all my life. I, uh, my first uh, national convention was going, I'll never forget, 1968 uh, in Chicago. And uh, which has, great meaning to me in many different ways, and I'll, I'll just tell this quickly, but uh, my wife and I had been married a couple of years, and, and we thought we were not going to have any children. And uh, the last thing we did before we left to go to Chicago for that convention, she went down to the Edna Gladney home. We still lived in Fort Worth in those days, and uh, started setting up the proceedings to adopt a child. Well, nine months to the day, <laughs> After that convention, our first daughter, Susan, was born. <laughs> and <laughs> she, uh, she kind of figured it out in high school. And one day she said to her mom, well, I guess it wasn't all fighting in the streets out there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but there's another part to this story. My, my great friend, Mary Hager, who worked with me and I worked with her for more than 20 years. She's now the executive producer of Face the Nation. Uh, one day I was looking in my little book there where I have important dates and I said, Mary, I just noticed your birthday here. You are exactly four years and one day older than Susan. And she said, yeah, my folks went to the 64 convention. <laughs> so I would just say to all of you, if you're looking for a little something to uh, spice up your love life, Go to one of these conventions that summer. It's the best advice I can give you. <laughs> and will that be the kind of commentary yes. you're providing at our, for our conventions coming up? Yes, I'm going to concentrate on sex. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs all this talk about the minimum wage? Yeah, we and get to what ISIS. people really want to know right. about. It, right. you know what I mean? <laughs> but this was, you've done this as part of um, Face the Nation for many years, yeah. where you have offered a take on. Yeah the news of the day, the news of the week, a longer sort of lens at the news. Yeah, and, and uh, it's, you know, I've been a reporter for so long that uh, that's the part I really uh, kind of enjoy the most is, is, is sitting back and trying to think of things and think about well, what does this really mean and, 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 and what, is, what is it gonna mean overall? And uh, uh, that, that's the part that, that I really kind of like. And uh, I, you know, I don't really, it doesn't bother me if people don't agree with me. Uh, but if people say, well, you know, I never kind of thought of it that way, or that's a different take on that, that that's what really makes me, uh, really makes me feel good and what I get the most fun. But, but you know, m mostly people say to me, you know, I remember when I was a young reporter and people said, who do you report for? Do you report for the other reporters? Do you report for the guy out there on the street? And I used to give all these big answers that I'd, I'm sure I didn't believe it anyway. And I finally concluded, who I do it for is me. I, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. I, I just like, you know, I like to be there when things are happening. I like to... Uh, I like to find out for myself. I like to be the first person that knows about something. And I've just kind of always been there. So uh, the reason I'm a reporter and have been it so long is it's just fun. I, I just can't think of anything else I'd rather do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been doing it for a long time. And, and that's why I'm, I'm really happy to get to, you know, get out and get another front row seat to look at this election, because my heavens. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I, I've, seen some, I've seen some campaigns in my time, but I have never seen one quite like this. Never, I mean, no. it, it's, it's just a surprise every day. And when can we see your first commentary? Well, I'm going to be uh, on your show tomorrow morning. <laughs> Shameless plug by me. Shameless. Yeah. And 
uh, it just offers some few thoughts. And, uh, but uh, my heavens, I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, I, uh, well, let's talk first about, let's get, let's get into this, but let's talk first about, because I'm sure many people here saw the State of the Union mm -hmm. last night. Mm -hmm. And Bob, you've been involved in every State of the Union going back how many years? And last night was the first night we missed you last night. Well, I, I, this was the first time that I really missed mm -hmm. uh, uh, being there uh, and, and uh, uh, being a reporter for CBS, because I, I, I think I've been to all of the State of the Union since probably I, I was, I went to the conventions in 1972, I think probably 76, mm -hmm. and I think I've done every one of the State of the Unions. To me, the State of the Union is the best night in Washington. I mean, it's acquired taste, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> swimming in the ocean. It, but I tell you to sit up there, and we used to sit up in the press box inside the hall there, and look out on that vast throng, and it's, it's like the National Zoo. I mean, <laughs> you look out there and there's one example of every kind of American. <laughs> there's one example. They're tall, they're short, they're white, they're black, they're brown. Uh, some of them are really smart, some of them are not very smart. They're all out there. And, and I just find it just, uh, it just, it, it puts a lump in my throat. And, and I always get the biggest kick out of them, watching the president come down the aisle, which is kind of the, this is the great ego walk. You know, you get your name announced and everybody stands up and gives you a standing ovation. Then you go down that aisle, then you get up there and they give you another standing ovation. And uh, it, it's uh, very, very heady stuff. But I, I just get a big kick out of it. it, it to me, it's, it is also the one night that people in Washington, and these nights are getting kind of rare now, where they actually get together and you know trade a few jokes and punch each other in the ribs and that kind of thing and it it used to be the sad thing is what's what's really happened and that's that's what's happened to our politics and I, I think Nora this campaign is the chickens have finally come home to roost I mean we we've been heading this way for a long time but the system has become so overwhelmed with money mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. that. Uh, Serious people, more and more serious people, just don't want to fool with it anymore. They don't want to do what you have to do uh, to, to campaign for and hold office now, and that is spend at least four hours a day uh, in that little cubicle over at the Democratic campaign headquarters or the Republican campaign headquarters, basically begging people for money. And, and people just have come to the conclusion this is not the way they want to spend their life. And so what we're left with is the people who are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different talent pool than we used to have. And uh, it's, I think that more than anything else is what's happened to our politics. Mm -hmm. The president said that last night, that it was his deep regret, his deepest regret as president, that, he was, that the partisan rancor had not gotten better. In fact, it had gotten worse. Well, I, I, I think that's right. I think that's correct. And I think the, the root of that uh, is, is that, you know, these, these candidates now, they have to spend so much time raising money. They don't spend any time in Washington anymore. Uh, they have to get back home and raise this money. It's just this unending burden. And I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just different. Yeah. They're different than the people who used to run for uh, office. And but isn't it also true, too, Bob, that now we have so many gerrymandered districts yes. that they are so blue or so red, meaning so Democratic, yeah. so Republican, that you have districts like Nancy Pelosi's district mm -hmm. versus Tom DeLay's district. So you don't have a district where it's, you know, 52, 48, and so you have to appeal you, when you do. Run for office to that's, ex them. that's exactly right, and I think that's the second thing that's wrong here. Is and the president said last night said we need to get back to a system where the constituents can vote for a candidate, not a district where the candidate picks his constituents. Mm -hmm. And so much of the time now, uh, that is what we have. I mean, you have some of these districts now in Texas. There's a district of, I grew up in Fort Worth. Uh, when I lived in Fort Worth, Tarrant County, uh, Jim Wright was our congressman. He, 
he knew everybody in Tarrant County and everybody knew him. I think Tarrant County now is divided up into five different congressional districts. One of them runs all the way down to the uh, county line of Harris County, which is Houston, down on the coast. There's a, there's a district out to the, to the west of us now that runs from Weatherford. All They've taken African-American places and put them in this. They put Hispanics yeah. and put them in this district. And this, this district runs all the way down to Austin and takes in the campus of the University of Texas, which is the last liberal bastion in the state of Texas is, is Austin, and especially the campus of the University of Texas. Their congressman, who happens to be a friend of mine, is a right-wing Republican. Uh, because he's from Weatherford, which is up by Fort Worth in that district. The district's so, so narrow that if you open the car doors, you're out of the district. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just unbelievable what's happened. But the result is people don't even know who their congressman is anymore. So if you can get the money to get elected the first time around, then as an incumbent, you have this um, money-raising ability, and uh, you're going to be, be there for a while. One of the reasons that the Republican Party right now is tearing itself apart on immigration. I don't know anybody uh, who thinks uh, on a, a serious person, who thinks on a national level that you can get elected by, uh, as a Republican by, by shunning Hispanics, right. the largest uh, demographic, the largest growing demographic in our country right now. Yet. For most Republican members of Congress, that's the easiest vote there is because most of them don't have very many Hispanics in their districts. Yeah. And so it's very easy for them to vote against immigration reform, but any political consultant or anybody who's going on a national scale will tell you that there's no way mm -hmm. that you're going to get elected uh, without Hispanic vote. You know, uh, Mitt Romney got a larger percentage of the white vote than Ronald Reagan did, yeah. and he didn't get elected. Right. That just shows you how the demographics of this country have changed. And he got the lowest percentage of the Hispanic vote since Bob Dole, Yes, 27%. Mm -hmm. And George W. Bush had got 40% mm -hmm. of the Hispanic vote. And I remember him campaigning. Remember, he campaigned as a compassionate conservative. He would speak Spanish out on the mm -hmm. campaign trail. And part of the reasons that Mitt Romney lost, they said, was because he had gone so far right during the primary talking about Hispanics mm -hmm. self-deporting themselves. So back to this election today, we have another Republican debate on Thursday, another Democratic debate on Sunday. How do you explain Donald Trump? <laughs> it's uh, getting good now. Let me, Bob! You know, I, uh, I, I've been, I started this uh, fellowship up at Harvard. And the first uh, seminar or whatever it was, I went in and I said, uh, <clears throat> let me tell you something. I take Donald Trump very seriously. I think he's going to be a formidable candidate. And boy, you could hear the coughs and the eyes rolling and all of that. At Harvard. Yes. I can't wait to go back <laughs> in February. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's become a cliche to say it, but it is people are really mad. People are frustrated. People are upset. And what, what Trump did is he made a very accurate list of what people are upset about. And uh, he told them he could, he could fix that. And uh, the, the appeal for that, I mean, people, look, I mean, I'm upset. Mm -hmm. You know, the government doesn't work anymore. Uh, the, you know, Ronald Reagan talked about the shining city on the hill. It's now the town where nothing works. All of the federal agencies that we used to take for granted, the Secret Service, the Veterans Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, all of these agencies, uh, nothing is happening. The Congress does nothing. They did manage to pass a budget. And I mean, everybody hailed that as a great thing uh, before Christmas, and it was. But I mean, you know, this is like congratulating somebody for something that they should have been doing all along. I mean, I remember one time when my, my brother was in college, and they, they, they was, uh, he's, you know, 60-something years old, so in those days there was a lot of narcotics on campus. And I remember he got in a big argument with my mother one time, and he said, you know, you never had to come down there to Austin and get me out of jail like some of my friends' parents had to do. And she said, you know, 
I didn't send you down there to go to jail. I sent you down there to go to school. I said, why do you think I'm going to thank you for doing something you were supposed to do? Well, I mean, I kind of feel the same way about the Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're not there for entertainment value. I mean, we have a government to improve the lives of citizens. If it doesn't do that, then, what, then what's, what's its purpose? Mm -hmm. But that, that's what's happened to our government. So people are really, really upset. And uh, Trump came along. Uh, he didn't have all this money that these others have, have uh, raised. People kind of like that. They thought he was independent. And I think in many ways, for a lot of people following him, he says, as frankly, as bad as some of the things he says are, he says what a lot of people wish they had the nerve to say to their boss, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that really uh, hit home with a lot of people. And uh, I, think, uh, I think he stands a very good chance of getting the nomination. I don't know if he will or not, but... Uh, I think he's, you know, somebody's got to beat him. And so far, if the polls are right, nobody has so far. Mm -hmm. One of the rising stars of the Republican Party, Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina, where the uh, third primary is going to mm -hmm. be the third big primaries in South Carolina, gave the, re the Republican response last night. Last month, she had said that Trump's call to ban Muslims was embarrassing to the party. It was unconstitutional, un-American. And last night, you heard her say, we shouldn't listen to the, the siren call, some of the angriest voices out there. You she know, I thought she, w I thought she stole the show, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how many people stayed around to listen to what she had to say. And it's always, you know, uh, making the response to the State of the Union is the hardest speech in the world to make <laughs> because, you know, you've had a guy out there where you're going through, everybody's getting up and giving him standing ovations and all of that, and then, you know, you go to this lonely person in some room somewhere that you don't even know where. Uh, but she, I mean, she laid it on. And, and it, it's, I mean... The problems that the Republican Party is having right now, which, I mean, it's, it's going through this, what are we and what do we want to be? I mean, I think she really underlined that. I mean, how many times? I mean, I, I've, I've covered all these State of the Union speeches over the years. I can never recall a time when the president of one party might have taken a shot. Yeah, he took a shot at maybe somebody in the other party who is getting ready to run for president. Uh, and you kind of expect that. But when the person who gives the response goes after the leading, the guy leading in the polls on the Republican side, which is exactly what she did, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was, I thought that was pretty remarkable. And I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be interesting to see what impact that yeah. that speech she made last night. Uh, for those of you who didn't stay up that late. Uh, you know, she basically said when times are tough, people often hear the siren call of the angriest voices at one point. I mean, she was clearly talking about Trump. At another point, she said, you know, when, when we had that awful tragedy, the shooting in, in Carolina said, we didn't turn against other people's religions. We turned to God, mm -hmm. which I thought was a, a pretty good, a pretty good way, to, way to put it. And... And then she said, sometimes it's not the loudest voice, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but it's, you know, we need to turn down the volume. Sometimes you can hear better when you turn down the volume. Well, all of that was aimed at him. And I, I just sat there with my mouth open. I, I, I never heard something like that happen. And I think it's going to, I guess it's going to improve her standing, mm -hmm. uh, at least among some parts of the party. And, you know, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan picked her they had to have some idea that that was coming. Uh, and I have no evidence whatsoever to support this, but it sounds to me like that, that had a kind of a Paul Ryan kind of tone to it. Yeah. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see because, I mean, some of these uh, columnists on the right have really torn her apart today. Laura Ingram said they should deport her, Nikki yeah. Haley. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought that was the most interesting part of the evening, Yeah. you know. So we have a scenario where Iowa could be won by maybe Ted Cruz, New Hampshire by Trump, Trump. South Carolina, Nevada could change. 
We then have March 1st, the SEC primary they're calling, and then March 15th, another whole set. Is it possible, given the changes that the Republican National Committee made and the proportional delegates, so you get handed out delegates, you know what I mean, if there's a clear winner, that we could have the first contested election since, convention rather, since 1976? I think so. We could have a fight, a Republican uh, fight. I think you could have a, a brokered uh, convention. And uh, uh, I, I kind of, and we have to be careful about this, Nora, because we all want that to happen so much because <laughs> we're reporters. <laughs> you know? But it gives everybody something to go home and talk about. But Say, yes, uh, we're going to have it. Yeah. I don't know a single <laughs> yeah. journalist who doesn't want we want it to. We want, it to. <laughs> yeah. uh, want that to happen, so we can't let that cloud, cloud our judgment. Yeah. But I do think that's entirely possible. You know what? The Republicans last year, they, uh, they were... Romney, you know, the Democrats, had, you know, everything was settled on that side. And, and, and Romney, uh, it just kept going on and on and on. And so they changed the rules that after March 1st, uh, they'll have a bunch of winner-take-all primaries, uh, which who knows how that's going to come out. And if you get by that time where you still have Trump in the race, you still have uh, Ted Cruz in the race, uh, Marco Rubio or somebody else, uh, is in the race, and one of them goes in there and gets, you know, 20% or 25% of the vote, and they get all the delegates. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's going to make make a difference too. But uh, I think I think it is possible that we could have have a brokered convention. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to the Democratic race. Two new polls out this morning. Well, actually, the national poll, CBS poll, showed that Hillary's national lead over Bernie Sanders has shrunk significantly. Mm -hmm. In the key states of Iowa and New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders has now retaken the lead in those two states. Is she in trouble? Yes, I think so. Uh, now, do I think she's not going to get the nomination? No, I don't. I, th I, I think she probably will. But, uh, you know, her campaign has is, is just had a lot of problems along the way. I mean, again, and I want to go back to my original point, our system is so broken that we're all familiar with, with the people who are running on the Republican side, but how is it uh, that the oldest party, the Democratic Party, has managed to come up with only one legitimate candidate with a national following? And that's Hillary Clinton. You may like her, you may hate her, but she is a legitimate candidate. And the guy that's running second is, is a socialist, who says he is not a capitalist. Now, you know, I've been, <clears throat> I've been covering a lot of conventions a long time <laughs> and a lot of politics, but I can't ever remember a candidate in the United States of America saying that he was not a capitalist. I, I told the folks up at Harvard, I said, he may get some votes around here, but I don't think he's gonna do that too good down where I came from. I mean, <laughs> they're kind of for free enterprise, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and he's a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. I like him, uh, I've interviewed him many times, uh, been around him, and, uh, but how is it that, w that this is where we are? We had a very, and we're gonna open it up for questions too, so I know they're passing out cards, so I encourage you to, to write on those and we'll read some of those questions. We had a very interesting discussion just backstage where we were talking about a Trump versus Hillary race. And Trump, though, seems the, to be the candidate who wants to go there and discuss Bill Clinton's past transgressions? Well, you know, there, there is a uh, political consultant in Australia. His name is Linton Crosby. And I think he actually managed one of David Cameron's campaigns uh, in Great Britain. And he has what he calls the, uh, the dead cat strategy. <laughs> and basically what he says is, it doesn't make any difference that you can be having a dinner party, uh, whatever you're talking about. If you throw a dead cat on the table, everybody starts talking about the dead cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's what Trump has shown himself to be the master of. I mean, yeah. people, people talk about him being a reality TV star. I, I, that's how I described him in the beginning, and I've known him for a long time. But I've changed my, I now think he's a master showman. 
Mm -hmm. is what I think. And he has this impeccable sense of timing. Mm -hmm. He knows how to just throw these things out there. I mean, every the conversation, the debates all may be going this way. And then he uh, says Ted Cruz may not be a, a natural born citizen, you know, or something. I mean, and then says, you know, I, I'm just bringing this up because I'm trying to help him. I, yeah. <laughs> but that's all everybody talked about for a week. Yeah. You know, uh, Hillary, and then suddenly we're going we're gonna to talk about Clinton. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton, here's the thing that I wonder about. Uh, I mean, he got their attention on that, and people say, do you think it's fair game? Yeah, it's fair game. In, in politics, fair game is whatever the people running say is fair game. But I wonder in this case if it's good politics. And, and here's why I, I say that. Whatever else you want to say about the Clintons, they've been very good all the way back to Arkansas. Uh, when their opponents go after them, they keep hanging in there and hanging in there until their opponents take it one step too far. And you can look about in the Paula Jones escapades way back there. You can look at Newt Gingrich and what happened to him. You can look at Tom DeLay. You can look at how the impeachment came out. And you can also look at Hillary uh, Clinton when she went before that Benghazi committee. I mean, I think there are some serious questions still to be asked about, about all that. I don't think we know all that, that transpired there. But when you put somebody in a congressional hearing for 11 hours, you know, and, and just keep it going in kind of like a Spanish Inquisition, I mean, I think they just took the issue right off the table. And, and, and so, yeah, he may go after uh, Bill Clinton on that, but I wonder if that if that is very good politics. That he may overplay his hand. Yeah. Or that they would make adva take advantage of that. Yeah. yeah. What's the biggest scoop you've ever had? Well, the biggest scoop I ever had never had my <laughs> never had my fingerprints on it in any way. But it happened this way. It was it was 1976. Uh, I was the White House correspondent covering uh, Gerald Ford. And we came up here to New York. Uh, he had some reason to come up here, but the real reason he came up was that he came up to be interviewed by Barbara Walters, who was then the, uh, uh, was then the uh, host of the uh, Today Show. And he did the interview uh, during the afternoon, and it was going to play the next morning. And Barbara put out the word that nobody was to interview President Ford until her interview aired. And if they did, they would be killed. <laughs> and Barbara, Barbara had a way of making you to believe that was true. But, you know, we we're all reporters, so we set about trying to figure out how to bust Barbara's scoop. So I, I went to the White House press secretary and I said, you know, what do you think? You think I uh, might be able to interview uh, uh, the pre no, no, absolutely not, said we've given Barbara our word. Nobody's going to talk to the president. Well, then the next thing you know, Walter Cronkite calls me. And he said, Bob, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the president is going up to Yonkers this afternoon. I thought I might come up. Is that all right? What was I going to say? No, Walter, you stay there. I'll, I'll hand. I said, well, of course, Walter. Do you think I might get to see the president? I said, well, I don't know, Walter. This is, I, I said, it's going to be tough. But I said, let me go see what I can do. So anyway, I went back to the press secretary. He said, get out of here. We're not going to do this. So I went to the president's 32-year-old uh, chief of staff. I called him Dick in those days. I later called him Mr. Vice President, Dick Cheney, <laughs> who was, I'm, I'm also going to just a sidelight and say, he was the best staff person I ever worked with. He was totally nonpartisan in those days. He was very helpful, uh, accessible. I used to talk to him. There were four or five of us that covered the White House. We talked to him three or four times a day. We talked to him a lot more than we ever talked to the, mm -hmm. to the press secretary. Well, that kind of thing just doesn't happen anymore. So I, I went to him and I said, heck, you know, I'm really under in a bind here. I said, the president's coming up here. And, I mean, Walter's coming out here, and he wants to say hello to, uh, to, to the uh, president. And he said, Bob, 
we're just not going to do that. So we've given our word uh, to, to Barbara, we're not going to do any interviews. And so I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, do you think it would be possible for, for Walter to just come back and say hello uh, to the president? I said, I, he, he loves President Ford, and I know President Ford loves him. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, we could do that. And I said, this is true. I said, do you think it would be uh, all right if I had a camera crew come back? <laughs> just, just take pictures of it. He said, Bob, we're not going to do any interviews. And I said, well, just, just, you know, to get the pictures and so Walter could have it for, he said, well, all right, we'll do that. Well, there was a, the big story going around was they just started the flu shots and people, uh, there were, a lot of people were getting sick, and the big question was, is the president going to take a flu shot? These, this was the first round of flu shots, and, and just, you know, set an example. That, and so that was a big, big story going around. So anyway, at the appointed time, we ran around to the back door of this place, and, and uh, Walter takes the microphone in his left hand, and the cameraman's right here, and I was behind the cameraman. He walked in. There was the president. He said, Walter. Walter walked over and shook hands with him and said, Mr. President, are you going to take your flu shot? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the press secretary literally grabbed Walter around the waist and drug him out of there. And <laughs> Walter was just, he was just about to burst out laughing because <laughs> he knew what he had just done. Well, anyway, to make make a long story short, that evening, the CBS Evening News began this way. Good evening. <laughs> President Ford told me in an exclusive interview <laughs> on the campaign trail today that he would take his flu shot. <laughs> well, <laughs> we then proceeded to play the interview, which was all of nine seconds. He said, yes, I'm going to, Walter. Yeah. And so that, while nobody but Walter Cronkite knew how that came about, but I have to say, uh, for my own personal uh, benefit, that's the best scoop I ever got. Because <laughs> after that, Walter thought I could do no wrong. <laughs> I loved him, and he loved me after that. <laughs> What do you do if you're in an interview, a press conference, something high profile, and you forget a question? You forget what you're going to ask. <laughs> that happened to me one time. When President Ford was president, and it was the first nighttime uh, news conference, I think, that he had, or something, but anyway. Like in the East Room? In the yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, it was live. and. Uh, he called on me, and my mind went totally blank. <laughs> I could not think of a single, I, I, I was just, and I thought, oh my God, they're up there in New York, they're watching this, and I, I had just come over, I just replaced Dan Rather as, as the White House correspondent. And so I, I'm sitting there, and I said, uh, well, Mr. President, what about the Russians? <laughs> Well, it's better to be lucky than smart. It just, it turned out that the president had a, uh, had something he wanted to say about Russian bombers or something. I don't even believe what it was. But anyway, whatever it was he said, it was on the front page of the New York Times the next day. <laughs> but, but that actually, that actually happened. I, oh, I was terrified. That's <laughs> terrific. So the lesson is trust your gut? <laughs> I, I think just wander around and maybe something good will happen. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I don't know how I got out of some of these scrapes, you know. It's just <laughs> Let's talk about um, Barack Obama in this presidency. What do you think has been, uh, what are the best things he has done? Well, I think he, he was an inspirational figure. You know, I was... Uh, at his inauguration, and I'll never forget, and, and you were probably up there too, we were up in that, CBS has this booth, it's really a double wide trailer up on top of a, the Jones Day law firm up there on Capitol Hill. And you could look out and you could see 
these million, literally millions of people. I think it's the largest crowd ever assembled in Washington at one time. And you know, there was such a wonderful air about it that amongst other things, and I bet you don't know this. This is something I know that you don't know, and you know everything. <laughs> there were only seven arrests that day. Three million people and only seven people were arrested. That's the kind of spirit Mm -hmm. that, that uh, just sort of permeated this. And I, I, think, uh, I think it was a great day for, for many people in America. And, and I think just his whole uh, presidency has, you know, in many ways, I, has been a, a great thing. Uh, I happen to think the, the Iran uh, deal, I, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the Part of the fallout from that is you saw the release of those uh, those, so, those sailors today, and uh, that might not have happened mm -hmm. uh, until we got into this this diplomacy. Uh, I think I think that was good. I happen to think the trade deal was good. Uh, I think I mean just from a standpoint of the strategic. Uh, fallout from that, because uh, you know we we spend so much time focused. On, on the Middle East now, and we have to because of terrorism. But the great challenge in the long term in, in American foreign policy is gonna be how we manage the relationship uh, with China. Yes. You know, and, and this, uh, this certainly aligns us with Japan and with South Korea, and I, I think Japan and South Korea have to be reassured of that. And I think the Chinese have to, to understand. Uh, the Pacific would be a different place if America were not there. And so I, I think that's one of the, uh, one of the most uh, important things uh, that he's done. I think, uh, I sometimes wish that Lyndon Johnson could come back to life and be his chief of staff. Mm, right. Uh, because of his relationship with Congress? He just knew how Washington worked. Yeah. He knew how to get things done. And that, uh, that is politics in the best sense of the word. And uh, I, uh, I think the president has been very, he's better at identifying problems in some cases than in, in finding solutions. I mean, just the political solutions uh, to the problems. Yeah. And, uh, the two people who knew most about how Washington works uh, that I covered in all the years I was there is uh, Johnson, number one, and number two, Mel Laird, the uh, Secretary of Defense for uh, Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not a single person from the Pentagon went to jail during Watergate. Mel Laird set up a system out there that any time anybody at the White House called the Pentagon, anybody, they had to go through his office. He did not allow anybody in the Pentagon to talk directly. And when somebody called out there and said, the president wants, his response was, well, then the president better tell me about it. You know, and, and he, he, he was a master politician, in, in my view, second, second only to uh, Johnson. And, you know, he had a great deal to do with uh, getting us out of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he was a great man. That leads us to some of your great questions from the audience. And the first one is, how does President Obama rank among U.S. presidents? You know, I want to tell you something. I, I have just made a, a rule that I think you need to wait about five years before you make a judgment. And I'll tell you, I learned that the hard way. I wrote a book about Ronald Reagan called The Acting President, which I thought Probably the title was better than the, the, the book, but it, it, was, it was a good book. And uh, it was the first book I wrote, and it came out, uh, I wanted to be the first one to get a book out about Reagan, and, and it came out in 1988, just after he left office. And I'm still proud of the book. It, it is accurate, but it is not true. And, and the reason I say that is this. I couldn't, I didn't know at that point when I wrote the book uh, that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. No. Uh, I didn't understand that it was going to take a while to, to make a judgment on that. And, 
And I think you need to wait at least five years before you try to make a judgment uh, uh, on a presidency. So I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how he would. I don't know how he would stand up. But uh, you can't judge a presidency until you have had time to see what some of the programs. I mean, I don't think Ronald Reagan won the Cold War, but I think his policies. Uh, he did force the Soviet Union into to bankruptcy. You know, and I think that was a big, a big part in the collapse of the Soviet Union. You have to give him some credit for that. This question, it's not really a question. It's more of an imperative here. Please tell us the Lee Harvey Oswald story. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> you know, this is a story I've told thousands of times. And uh, I, I always hesitate to tell it because I'm just sure everybody already knows it. But Has that, how many people have heard the Lee Harvey Oswald story? Okay, there, well, there you go. Okay, okay. We'll get the... that's good. I uh, <laughs> when I was a reporter at the Fort Worth Star Telegram on that fateful weekend that Kennedy came to Dallas, and Kennedy uh, went several places before he came to Dallas, and he spent the night in Fort Worth, and I was really upset. I was the night police reporter at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and. I was really upset because I wanted, you know, the president was coming, he was going to spend the night in our town. 10,000 people had come out to Carswell Air Force Base just to see him get off Air Force One. He got a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, welcome there. And, uh, but I was told that my job was to cover the police beat and the political reporters would handle that. So there's nothing like, you know, a big story going on in your town and you're, you're not part of it. So anyway, uh, I didn't get off work till three o'clock in the morning, so I was asleep the next day uh, when, uh, when Kennedy, he made his speech at the Hotel Texas and my wife was there with her father. Uh, my brother who was in high school, uh, my mother had taken him down to uh, see Kennedy who made a, a speech out in the driveway and all that. But anyway, they had, had come, come back uh, home and my brother came in and woke me up and he said you better get up so there, there's a report that the president has been shot in Dallas well number one I was sound asleep nothing like that had ever happened to anybody who was alive at that time we'd, we'd never had any of these kind of events I jumped up uh, dressed as quickly as I could by the time I drove to the paper uh, it came over the radio that the president was dead just as I was walking into the city room. So I, I really kind of lost it. And I, so I go up and I'm just trying to uh, help as best I could to answer the phones in the city room. As you can imagine, it was just total bedlam. And uh, the phone rang and I answered and a woman said, is there anybody there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, well, lady, you know, but we don't run a taxi here and besides the president's been shot. And I was about to hang up the phone when I heard her say, Yes, I heard on the radio, I think my son is the one that they've arrested. And it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. And uh, I quickly forgot that part about the taxi service. <laughs> and I said, now, where do you live? And uh, she, she told me, and I wrote down the address, and I said, I was 26. I said, now, I'm going to have to ask you in the interest of national security. I said, when you hang up this phone, don't answer it if it rings again. I said, I'm coming out there, I'm gonna get you. It's protecting that scoop. And, uh, cause I knew it was only a matter of time sure. until people figured out. She was this itinerant uh, uh, maid and nurse and things like that and moved all over the South in Texas. So anyway, uh, I had a TR4 sports car and I, I thought, well, I can't take this woman over to Dallas, which is about 35 miles. And, and, and the top was down on it. It took a long time to get the top up. So I, I, I went to the auto editor of the paper and uh, the local car dealers would always give him a car to drive and he would drive it all week and then he would write up a little report on, you know, give it a review in the Sunday paper. These were generally good reviews. You can see how this works. <laughs> free car, free gas and all of that. And he said, well, I've got a Cadillac sedan. And I said, that's great. And so we went up to the city desk and the city editor and we talked to him. And so we got in that Cadillac and, and drove out there. And sure enough, on standing on the curb of this uh, neighborhood out on the west side of Fort Worth, this little woman in a white nurse's, practical nurse's uniform, a little blue 
bag, and so I got in the back seat with her, and uh, Bill, the other guy's name was Bill Foster, and he drove, and we, we drove her over to Dallas. And what was, what was amazing about it, in those days, uh, the ethics were a little bit different. We never told people who we were unless they asked. You know, If they asked, we told them. So when I got to the Dallas police station, I was wearing a snap rim hat. I always did, so I'd look like a cop. And I uh, said to the first uniform officer, I said, I'm the one that brought Miss uh, Oswald, his mother, over. Is there any place we can put her where these reporters won't bother her? And, <laughs> and they actually found me a, a, <laughs> a little office in the police station there, and it was great. And we got in there, it was in the burglary squad, and there was a phone back there, so I could go out in the hall and you know, gather up information from our other reporters and take it back and phone it in. And what, it's really funny what kids don't understand these days in this cell phone era. If you didn't have a phone in those days, you didn't have a story. Yeah. You know? And this was a big deal, because some of those reporters were, they'd have to go up the street and use pay phones and stuff. So it's dark, and we were there four or five hours. Uh, finally, uh, this... Uh, she said to me, she said, do you think they'd let me talk to my son? And I said, well, I don't know. So I went to Captain Will Fritz. And they would do things like this in those days. And I said, she'd really like to talk to her son. And he said, well, we probably ought to do that. And they, they would often do things like that to make sure people knew they weren't beating up suspects and stuff like that. So anyway, we were all led into this little uh, uh, holding room off the jail and they were going to bring Oswald down and, to talk to his mother. By, there his, by that time his wife had gotten there and uh, uh, to make a long story short uh, finally somebody standing in the corner said who are you and I said well <laughs> what do you mean he said are you a reporter and I said well yeah and he said son he said you need to get out of here because he said if I ever see you again I'm going to kill you and I mean, he was so mad that I think he, I think he meant it. I mean, I don't think he would have, but uh, he was just furious. And, and I made a lot of excuses and quickly excused myself. And that was, that was the end of the, uh, end of the story. But, you know, again, we go back to this, uh, why do you want to be a reporter? Well, where else, even in a time of national tragedy like that, could you have that kind of an adventure mm -hmm. and be uh, 26 years old? And, uh, you know, when kids say, uh, uh, should I be a reporter? I say, well, I don't know about you, but I don't know anything I could have done that I had had more fun. But that's, uh, mm -hmm. again, it's one of those deals. If you're in the right place at the right time, I just happen to be the kid that answered the phone. And, and that's what I tell these young people today. Answer the phone. Yeah. Oh, I know. When the phone rings, answer it. I mean, don't let somebody else in the office answer it. That's that's where the news is, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and pick up the phone and ask when you want to ask someone for something rather than shooting them an email. Yeah. Yes, I, I had a young reporter that was trying to interview me about something, and I said, sent me an email, and I said, sure. And uh, I said, here's my phone number, and and call me. And he said, well, I'd really prefer dealing by email. So, you know, I mean, yeah. you think, what can I tell this kid? Probably not much. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> He'll have to find his own way. Another question. Assuming Donald Trump becomes president, what challenges will he have waiting with Congress and what advice would you suggest to him? You know, I, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I, uh, I think he may well get the nomination. Uh, the Republican nomination. You do? He might. I, I'm not saying that he will, but he, uh, he might. But I think the Republican Party is so divided right now that uh, I, I think it would be, it'd be very difficult. It'd be very difficult. No, I, I wouldn't have. I, what advice would I have for Donald Trump? <laughs> I have no advice for him. I mean, I mean everything, you know, the things. Uh, he has done that I thought would, you know, disqualify a person mm -hmm. uh, just immediately. I mean, you know, calling John McCain a loser uh, and Putin a winner. Uh, I mean, I, and, and yet he seems to just keep going on. So I, I don't have any advice for him at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about Hillary? Well, she said, what about Hillary? Uh, 
I think Hillary's just got a. Uh, Who would you know, be the toughest Republican for her to face? Do you think? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, it, it would be. I, I don't know. I don't know who would be. I, I, my, my advice uh, to Hillary, I, I think she, uh, her campaign seems kind of wooden to me. I mean, it seems sort of unspontaneous. I mean, I think she's very well qualified. Uh, but I keep waiting for, uh, you know, kind of a breakout moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's happened yet. I mean, you know, who knows? Uh, the way this thing is going this year, maybe Democrats will have a brokered convention too. I don't, I don't think they will, but uh, it's just impossible to predict what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. How did you navigate the changing media landscape over the last half century, especially in the age of cable news and social media? And how has the digital age affected politics and has it been for the better or worse? Worse. It, it's turned everything upside down. Uh, we now, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I was a newspaper reporter when most Americans got their news from newspapers. And uh, then that weekend of the Kennedy assassination, that changed. From that time on, uh, most Americans got their news uh, from television. Now we really don't know where they get their news. But what's happened here is we've seen so many of these local newspapers, and to me, that that is the real crisis in journalism right now is is the death of these local newspapers where newspapers just can't find a business model uh, to keep going I, th I think we'll probably wind up where our newspapers will be you know you'll get it on your iPad I'm not sure how much longer paper newspapers are going to last but it's not whether it's printed on paper or whether it's it's on the iPad it's the content right. that matters and, and it's accurate information. And that's, that's one of the things that makes this campaign so, so different, is uh, sometimes it's not issues, but facts that are being challenged. I mean, there is some, some of the weirdest stuff out here right now. I mean, there's, there's some story about going around out in Iowa about uh, somebody saying that Obama, if, if if Hillary loses, that Obama will not leave. <laughs> and I mean, you know, this is being discussed seriously. You know, I, I read a long dialogue, you know, about this. Uh, you know, you have uh, websites reporting that they're going to settle 250,000 Syrians, refugees. Well, uh, nobody right. has suggested that. I mean, it's just totally false. And, and yet, it's, it, this is the kind of information uh, that is going around. And, and it's very, very difficult uh, to have a serious campaign. It's very difficult to have a serious conversation about all of this uh, when people, you know, we used to when there were three television networks and one independent station and probably a good newspaper in every town. Uh, we all kind of, maybe we didn't agree with the editorials, but we all accepted and took for granted that what was in the paper was true. Yeah, there were some or basic to the facts. Best, and, and we were all basing our opinions on the same data, on the same set of facts. I think now uh, what, what has made it so difficult is we're not basing our opinions on the same facts. People that listen to one news station and get one set of facts, and people that listen to another one get another set of facts, and then they make their, uh, make their opinions, but they're not based on, on, on the same facts. And uh, too many times that's happening now, and, and we're so overwhelmed by this information that we, that we can't process all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the main jobs that we do, you and I do, is to try to sort through all of this stuff and mm -hmm. tell people what we think is is important, and that's, that's harder now because there's more of it to sort through, mm -hmm. you know. Um, not to digress, but I mean, one of the facts out there that has been you know, lost is since 9-11, more people have been killed by white supremacists and others in this country than have been killed by mass shootings and terrorists. 
Really? So, so let me rephrase that so I get it right. More Americans have been killed by white supremacists and others than have been killed by ISIS or terrorists in the United States. So the threat that we're all living under a terrorist threat, there have been white supremacists, the, the example of the Charleston, South Carolina shooting, mm -hmm. he was a white supremacist who killed those nine in the church. But we're all living under this sense of fear that there's going to be a mass shooting from someone who's a terrorist or ISIS, mm -hmm. when in fact there have been more homegrown threats. On this note, as a political junkie, a question from the audience, I wonder what advice you would give to other hosts about neutrality. They all try, but none achieve close to your level of fairness and neutrality. You are missed. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. I think all of us sometimes were better at it than other times. And, and, but, you know, it is very difficult to be objective. I don't think anybody except somebody on a life support system is objective. But it is much easier to be fair than it is to be objective. And basically being fair means when someone challenges somebody or, or makes uh, an accusation against somebody, uh, you have an obligation to go ask that person. Let them respond. Well, how do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. you, ha you have an obligation to check out whether that's accurate or not. But you know, in all the years that you know, I covered Capitol Hill and covered the White House and stuff, I, I never, found people uh, would get mad at me because of any ideology or something. Uh, they'd get mad at me if I didn't put their side of it in a story where they, they were included. And I think especially when you, when you challenge somebody's character, uh, that you have an obligation to number one, do you the best of your ability to find out if the accusation is true, and number two, give them a chance to get their side of it in. I think most people, uh, when you give them a, si a chance to, to state their side of it, uh, you know, that they, think that's, that, that they think that's okay. I mean, I certainly do. When somebody says something about me, I want them to at least give me the courtesy to come and ask me. Right. You know, somebody said, you're a jerk. Well, I might have another side to that. I, <laughs> As we wrap up here, I want to ask you, why'd you get into political journalism? You know, uh, I, I've thought about that. And the first politician, and I think it's because of this, the first politician I ever saw, uh, I was 11 years old, and it was Lyndon Johnson, and he was running for the United States Senate. And he, we heard that he was coming to the vacant lot where we played baseball. Mm. And the reason it was a big deal in our community was uh, he was coming in a helicopter and this was on the west side of Fort Worth, and we had never seen a helicopter. Yeah. So my dad took me down there and everybody's uh, dads, and you know, it was a big community thing, and we all went down there, and, and then all of a sudden, up in the sky, you know, here's this airplane with no wings making all this noise, and then on this bullhorn, this is your candidate for the United States Senate of, you know, Lyndon Johnson. I, I've often thought about it, and I think I know just how Moses felt when he realized the burning bush was talking directly to him. You know, we didn't know if it was a politician. We didn't know if it was God. We didn't know what it was. I mean, just this voice coming out of the sky, and then he lands, and he gets out of that helicopter, and he, he makes this rousing speech like politicians used to make because, you know, they had to hold the crowd, and if they weren't make a good speech, everybody would wander off. He made this wonderful speech, and then at the end of the speech, he took his hat off and threw it out into the crowd, waved goodbye, <laughs> got on the helicopter, and flew off into the sunset. <laughs> and you know, Nora, I can remember every minute of that day, and I can't remember any of the campaign commercials from the last campaign, and you don't want to. But that's when I kind of fell in love with politics. I'll tell you the little add-on to that story. I later told that story to uh, Jake Pickle, who was a congressman uh, who got elected to Congress in, this, in Johnson's congressional district, his old congressional district. And I, I told Jake that story one time because he asked me, he said, how'd you get interested in politics? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, that was my job in the campaign. And I said, what? He said, oh, I was the hat catcher. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, my God. He said, Linda Johnson was the tightest man on the face of the earth. Said, 
he wasn't going to waste a hat on every campaign stop. He said, so my, <laughs> my job was I'd stand there, and when he saw me, he'd throw that hat to me. I'd take the hat, run around behind the helicopter, give it to him. <laughs> They'd take off, and I'd drive as fast as I could to get to the next stop. That's what we miss today. We do. That's what we miss today. And I'll tell you something else, Nora, and this is part of what's wrong with our politics. Every single person who had, uh, who had a part in getting Lyndon Johnson to that rally did it for free. They did it for nothing. They all had real jobs. Some of them worked at the bank. Some of them were in the labor union. Some of them were at the grocery store. We have managed to outsource all the things that they used to do in politics for free to people who are making these enormous sums of money mm -hmm. to do it for us. And every time we do that, we take the politician, we put more of a distance between the politician and, and, and the people. And we spent in the last campaign $7 billion. We spent the, on the presidential campaign two and a half billion dollars. And I would just ask you folks, do you think the quality of the candidates that our system today is producing is any better than the candidates of that day? I'm not sure that that's true. But I think we have got to find some way to put people back into this process. Uh, Maybe one of the good things that's happening here is these enormous sums of money that people are raising don't seem to be making much difference in this campaign. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between the amount of money they've raised and their standing in the polls so far on, on either side. So if, if we've gotten to the point where people don't, pay, don't believe much of anything anymore, but maybe if they don't even believe these campaign ads anymore, maybe, maybe that's a good thing. So. But that's how, I, that's how I got interested in politics. Bob Schieffer, thank you all very, very much.